I, I'm very passionate, Tim, that we in the sales world are starting to explore the wrong question. Not starting. We've been we've been exploring the wrong question for a long time, which is how do we make our salespeople better? Uh-huh. And w- there's no shortage of ways to make your salespeople better. What we should be trying to say is how do we make our salespeople different? Conversations are at the heart of everything we do. But how do you turn a conversation into revenue? Welcome to B2B EQ, a podcast from Unifor. I'm your host, Tim Harris. Join me as I interview business leaders and market makers to learn how to move deals forward, scale best practices, and establish relationships that create value and grow revenue. Let's get started. Welcome back to another episode of B2B EQ. Today's guest is someone who has not only led a sales institute and is absolutely advocating for the sales profession in college and beyond, but somebody who's also doing research in the field and has been helping us validate some of our studies around EQ, around sales engagement, around conversational intelligence. He's a PhD in business administration. He is the founder of the FSU Sales Institute and also a seller at heart. Many years spent in the field selling and making that happen. He's got over 40 companies that support his program and over 400 students becoming professional sellers in the next few years. I'm excited to have on Lef Bonnie. Lef, great to have you. Awesome. Thanks uh, Thanks for letting me be with you today, Tim. Yeah, I love the... I love the uh... Uh, he, you know, he does all this stuff, but he was also a salesperson. I like to tell people I'm a, I'm a recovering salesperson, right? Like, uh, I've found a way to still, you know, look at sales from a distance, but I don't have to be in the day to day, uh, trenches, uh, that, yeah. uh, that salespeople face. Well, I think it's, it's important, right? It's passionate about the service that sales provides and what your experience was and either probably, and we'll have to get into this probably the positives of what you got from sales, making sure students experience that and some of the negatives maybe you saw in sales, making sure we can can maybe right those wrongs for the next generation. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Let's get into uh, it. Uh, I love it. Well, Lef, we met because of corporate visions and your work at the Sales Institute and we came to you with a big challenge and said, hey, we've got a hypothesis. Same reason why this podcast exists. EQ is at the heart of every relationship. It's the soft skills that make deals move forward and and make sellers stand above their peers, right? Make that lasting impact. What what got you interested in maybe jumping on this journey with us in terms of the uh, the research side? Yeah. Well, you know, it's interesting you know, when we look at uh, academic research on the topic. EQ is not something that's really been talked a lot about in sales. Uh, surprisingly, right? I mean, it's, uh, yeah. it's it's one of those skills that we all know has to be playing a major role in, in a salesperson's success. And in fact, I think a lot of times when you hear someone say, this person has the it factor, I think EQ is a big part of that. And, uh, and so, um, you know, it's interesting to me that there was such a hole in the in the academic world on the topic. So when, when you guys sort of came on the scene for us and said, hey, we're interested in doing some research on this. My, obviously, my original sort of thought was, this is silly. Surely there's tons of academic research already on this. So I'm just going to go look some articles up <laughs> and uh, I'll spout them off to you and sound really smart, but it's, you know, uh, but, but really stealing from someone else. Uh, and after I got into it and realized, actually, there's very little <laughs> written on, uh, on EQ, emotional intelligence, uh, gauging sentiment, responding to it appropriately, et cetera. Again, you know, it's one of those things we, we take for granted and we think it, we know it should be a, be a factor, but the sort of diving down into the, the real nitty gritty of it, uh, academics haven't done it. So that was exciting to, to say, let's go see if we can get past the initial, of course it matters to get mm-hmm. into some, yeah, but how and why and when and all those kinds of things. So that was an exciting proposition for us. Well, and, and it's amazing because what I found and people are probably going, well, what's a sales institute and how is this a professional research and, and, and a whole profession in college? You know, I, I didn't look at sales as a as a degree when I was going to school. I, it would have been an amazing degree to maybe look at. You went into general business um, or communications, right? That right. was kind of it. And then you find sales afterwards. But one thing you told me that stood out was 400 students, 40 companies all supporting this. And when you shared pictures and shared stories, it was 
everything that I see happening in a great sales floor at a company, but all happening in a collegiate environment, which was unbelievable to see. So kind of take our, our listeners back. How'd you get the idea for the FSU Sales Institute? What was the, the brainchild there? And then how has it grown and, and developed over the years? Yeah. Um, you, you know, interestingly, when I when I went to go get a PhD, so I, I left corporate America after about 12 years of, of leading sales teams and working a couple of different uh, Fortune 500 companies. I didn't know that there were sales teams out there or sales uh, you know, programs out there. And, and in fact, a lot of other academics didn't know they were out there. So um, the, sort of a funny story is as I was coming out of the PhD program, a lot of my mentors at my school were saying, don't be the sales guy. There's no sales jobs in academia. Uh, these people stay in sales. You, you got to be this sort of marketing strategy person or you know, B2B marketing, but you can't be sales. And interestingly, as I was sort of entering the job market uh, back in 2008, uh, interestingly, uh, FSU said, no, we're looking for someone with a sales background and who has a PhD because we had a dean who was very uh, visionary at the time. Mm -hmm. And she said, listen, there's data that shows that 80 percent of all marketing majors are going to go into sales. And there's wow. data that shows that really 65% of all college of business graduates go into sales, which a lot of people hear that number and they think that's ridiculous. How can 65%? But, you know, let's think about it. What does a finance major do? Well, a huge number of them go off to be financial advisors. That's a sales job, right? <laughs> um, you know, and you can go down the list, you know, a lot of yeah. supply chain people. Uh, are going to work for third-party logistics providers. And what are they doing in those jobs? They're trying to sell logistics services. So when you go down the list, uh, you start thinking through what people do in jobs, it's, you know, almost no matter what function, we, we all know there's sales involved. And so with that said, our, our dean said, listen, no one, we, all these kids are going to go get jobs in sales. Nobody's teaching it. And we're not. <laughs> Mm -hmm. So that's kind of been the rise of the Sales Institute was a word dean sort of being made aware by corporate America that, hey, we need sales skills in your graduates. So, again, back up to 2008, she said, I want to be one of the preeminent schools in sales and we got to go hire faculty to do that. So luckily, I, that's how I got to be at FSU. So when I got there, we had 30 kids uh, taking a couple wow. of classes that had interest in sales. And over the 15 years or so that we've been at it now at FSU, we now have a sales major. So, so kids are actually graduating with an actual degree in sales, uh, which makes us fairly unique. There are other schools that do it, but to have an actual major is still, still pretty unique in, in this country. Mm -hmm. uh, like you said, we have 400 students doing it. <laughs> now we have 40 companies that have shown up on our doorstep saying, hey, we want to sponsor this. Uh, mainly for recruiting purposes. They, they are the ones recruiting those students. Uh, they have a I night can only imagine the, the leading sales organizations getting people that have already spent two to three years with you or four years with you learning all the traits of the trade. Yeah. Well, yeah. One, of my, one of my colleagues at another school at a conference once, I, I saw him say to the crowd, how many people would love to have a continuous source of trained sales talent always ready for you to recruit. <laughs> and of course, everyone in the room raised their hand. And he said, now, how many of you are involved with sales for a collegiate sales program? And very few raised their hand. And his point was, why are you not, why are you not at these schools? Yeah. Uh, they are, they are continuously cranking out in FSU's case. We're graduating uh, 150 to 200 students every year um, with another 250 coming right behind them each semester, right? Uh, they're just ready to go. There's a huge talent there. So you're right, Tim. It's, it's been a fun journey. It's been fun to, to build it in terms of, um, watching the program grow, but you know, even FSU, we, we can't supply the market. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, we do try to help other schools and, and now there's roughly, and, and by the way, I should full transparency. FSU was not the first sales institute. I was, I'd say we were in the top 20 in terms of first 20 uh, in the, in the world. Um, and now there's about 120. So in 15 oh, wow. years it's grown to, but still there's, you know, thousands of universities in this country and mm -hmm. only 120 are really playing the sales game. So still a lot of room to grow, uh, our supply, so to speak, through uh, helping other college programs get get off the ground. That's tremendous. Cause I, I think, you know, sales 
at certain times or when you go to college, sales is kind of a dirty word. Like, oh, I'll go do this and then I might end up in sales, right? And I think that's what we all talk about. And it, it's, I was talking to Todd Capone a few episodes back, he, you know, he's telling me some of the history of sales. And in the 1920s, 1930s, how the president of the United States showed up and spoke to the, the kind of sales conference at that time of, of the world and said, yep. this is how America makes its, makes its place in, in the world. It's a service organization and sellers are going to do this. Fast forward, sales has always been the, oh, yep, he's in sales, makes great money, but not exactly the most honorable, you know, lawyers, sellers, some of those things <laughs> right, have always right. been at the table. And so I love that this is rebuilding to me also that that position of sales as not a dirty word as as a truly honorable profession of service and that's what our economy is in the US i mean we are a service economy through and through yeah yeah for sure and you know that's probably our one of our biggest um, uh, obstacles isn't finding companies to come grab our students it's finding students willing to you know take the leap into sales and so we have a uh, you know, obviously multiple classes that our students have to go through, but the very first one is just, we, you know, it's an intro to sales, but we call it the mind change class because all we're trying to do in that class is get the students to realize that, Hey, it's, it's not, you know, the, the sleazy salesperson that is yeah. what it makes up today's professional, you know, sales pool. That's not what this is. And, and we go on to illustrate why that wouldn't even work in today's world anyway. I mean, you know, sales is such for the most part, every sale is repeatable. And uh -huh. if you're if you're the sleazy salesperson in a B2B world, you won't last very long because you might get a couple of sales, but you won't get the rest and yeah. uh, or the, and you won't get the repeat. So anyway, we, we spend a lot of time helping students sort of come to the realization that, wow, this is just something I can I can go do. So and do it in honorable, like you said, honorable sort of fashion. That's awesome. And I want to jump into the curriculum. But there's one thing that I noticed when we got to walk that campus that amazed me. We walked through the entire campus. You might have planned this. You might have planned today, but I don't think so. Every student that we ran into that was highly involved in the campus at the time and was in the sports complex, was greeting people and giving them tours around campus, just so happened to also be in the <laughs> sales college and well-spoken, the soft skills. I didn't ask them for the speeds and feeds of their, you know, their university, but their ability to start a conversation, build rapport, and and just greet somebody out of the blue was tremendous. I mean, yeah. I have to tip my hat to that, and, and a tip to not only the the students but your your curriculum there. So, what does a sales degree look like? I know we've talked a little bit about some of the role playing and some of the things you do. What are some of the curriculums that that a student does go through? I, I really want you to kind of sure. share that with with our audience. Well, yeah, sure. So like I said, that, that first sales in class is, and, and by the way, we, that, that class is required for all marketing majors at FSU. So whether they're going to go into sales or not, they come through this sort of intro, the change your mind class. And, um, uh -huh. and a little marketing and sales alignment too, I have that's to That's right. That's I right. Because we want the, we want the marketers to realize too, that, <laughs> hey, uh, whether you like it or not, you're probably going to have to work with your sales team. Uh, let, let's make sure you understand what they're doing. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, so that, but that, from that intro class is usually where a young student, uh, yeah. will, um, will change their mind. Right. And okay. Yeah. I think I do want to be a sales major or at least get, get a sales minor. Um, and so from that class, they move into, so that's the change your mind class. Then they move into what do we call our advanced sales course. And that is just role plays nonstop for the rest, for an entire semester. Okay. And that's the class we call the change the behavior class. Like, okay, now we're going to actually change your behaviors around what you think selling is, which a lot of them show up trying to be the fast talking, you know, pitch artist. And, <laughs> you know, we have to sort of break that down and then come back to, Hey, no, that's, that's not what we're trying to do here. Um, so they get a whole semester where they probably do something in the neighborhood of 15 role plays that are scored, judged, coached, critiqued. Um, you know, they're recorded, so uh, they're constantly having to go back and give them give themselves critique. They critique their peers. Um, it's just a, a full immersion into all things role play. We have a sales management course. So also we want students to understand sort of the operation side of running a sales organization. We know that most of our students are going to go off and be sales leaders right out of the gate, but they need to understand what that career looks like. 
And they also need to understand why their boss might be doing what they're doing. Yeah. You know, and so we give them the, uh, the, the semester long management uh, class. And then we have one other course that is competitive sales uh, role plays. So in, in, after they've sort of moved through that, that next tier of management and role play class, they kind of go to the, our, our capstone course, which is a competitive uh, role play class. So it, this is where wow. people are going to get racked and stacked on uh-huh. how did you do? Just like in a real sales environment, <laughs> you know, how yeah. are you doing all semester long against your peers as it as it relates to uh, performance uh, in sales meetings? So, um, so really, they end up with two full, almost a full year of tons and tons and tons of role plays. So uh, I say all that to say the reason you saw saw students that were so outgoing and professional is because. I think if anything else, not only do they come away with sales skills, but they're just so confident. Yeah. <laughs> they're, they, they've gotten past the nervousness of talking to a stranger uh, in a professional way. And so um, I really think if anything, it might probably even maybe more so than the skills we're teaching uh, is the confidence to be able to go out there and give it a shot. So um, it's, it's no wonder you observe that as you were walking around campus. Well, and it's great to see because, I, I spend a lot of time talking to enablement folk and, and leaders of teams and the, the challenges that constantly come up. I'm sure the challenges you hear from the companies you work with is like, well, I got my top performers. Can I just turn them into managers? Right, right. God, they'd love a class like that to say, <laughs> what does management of a sales team look like and why is it different than being a high performing seller? Right. Right. I mean, the, 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 actual live training in the live environment to actually test stuff very rarely our teams or they're getting better at it but but there's a lot of organizations that just go nope here read the speeds and feeds of our product now get on a call and start listening and start start drinking from the water fire hose i'm sure there's sellers out there listening to this podcast going yep that's how i learn yeah so to get all those things you're also setting the foundation and and i would say if you're open to it anyone in the enablement or or that space right now, trying to figure out how to build out a program for your team, please connect with Left because you've built the foundational pieces. Yeah, it for sure. Amazing. We've learned a lot, you know, because another thing yeah. that we're doing is sort of studying what is the best way to teach somebody sales. You know, we, we have the advantage of being able to sort of change from semester to, me- to semester the tactics that we're using to train these students. Whereas somebody in learning and development or even sales enablement in the real world, you don't have that ability necessarily to say, I'm going to change up our whole uh, our whole corporate training program around sales. So you don't get a lot of um, you know opportunities to experiment and, and sort of play with what with best and build best practices around that. So so yes, I'm, I, I I do appreciate your call to to sales enablement people. Like reach out. I think it, it's it's a good conversation to sort of talk about uh, how, how do we do what we do and and, yeah. why, and why why you think it works pretty well. Because because I I'm married to a teacher. My mom was a teacher, and I can say that the the audience that I spent time with in Seattle recently at the SEC, all sales enablement. That's what it felt like to me. It felt like you're around a a group of teachers, people that really wanted to help their teams grow, learn, and expand their knowledge yeah. to succeed. And that was cool. It was a really different, I think, uh, environment than your traditional sales environment maybe over the last five years. So it's been a big transition. So with that, I'll transition into some of the research. We've been doing some of the stuff we're doing around EQ. And if you could just kind of set it up, we came to you with this study and said, hey, I think our hypothesis is that EQ is foundational and, and the spark for kind of sales success. And without giving the whole report away, because we'll be giving that out soon enough, um, maybe share some insights or some of the things that really stood out to you that, that you had found that, where we went, oh, wow, maybe those are aha moments or, yeah. or something. Else. Yeah, sure. Well, a couple of things. Um, it, 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 we, and I guess I should sort of th- tack this on before we jump into this is I guess one of the other things that does make FSU Sales Institute somewhat unique is we are a tier one research school, yes. uh, which is, which is again, not, that's not a boastful statement. That's just uh, how FSU is categorized among all universities. Uh, and so what does that really mean? Well, that means as faculty members, we come with a research obligation. Uh, a lot of schools who are in the sales game only have the teaching side, smaller mm-hmm. schools, private schools. They don't really have huge research uh, mandates like we do. Uh, but that's a good thing for us in the Sales Institute because 
a lot of what we do and train isn't left Bonnie's opinion of what he did to be successful, you know, 20 years ago when I was in sales, it's, it's research-based. It's, you know, uh -huh. we're constantly studying companies and, and what sets great sellers apart um, from everyone else. So with that said, uh, we used that 40 company base to then go off and do a little research on this idea of EQ. Um, so it was, it was interesting, uh, Tim, you know, we had a lot of hypotheses coming out of our meetings with you yep. of, you know, yep. what, what, what do we want to go test? What research questions were we trying to tackle? Um, and I think, you know, the first one, uh, as a teaser for thinking about that, that, uh, white paper that'll be coming out soon. The first research we, qu uh, research question we tackled was where does EQ rank among all of the skills and competencies salespeople should have? in order to be successful. Um, and, and it was a little bit of a, a poor question because what the research <laughs> showed us is it doesn't rank at all in the sense of it doesn't fall in some hierarchy of, oh, well, first is needs discovery. And then the next is product knowledge. Oh, and then there's EQ. And then there's you know presentation skills and objection handling. And that wasn't what we found. It doesn't fall into those sort of just you know list of, of skills and competencies. What we found is it's an ultimate accelerator on all of those things. In other words, when you mix needs discovery with good EQ, it's worth way more than just good needs discovery by itself. And if you yeah. mix objection handling with EQ, it's exponentially more valuable than just objection handling by itself. So, um, you know, the, the way the model sort of fell out is you're looking at it wrong if you're thinking of EQ is just something that's in the list of things a salesperson should should have in their toolbox. It's the toolbox. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's the wrapper that all the other skills should go into uh, so that each time you're pulling it out, when you combine the, the toolbox with the tool itself, it has way more value. Um, so, so that's going to be, I think, sort of eye opening for people when they read through that report to see just how dramatic the increase of those skills on sales outcomes is when mixed with high levels of EQ. And that was the fascinating part to me because you're, you're spot on. Like I remember coming to you and said, no, this has got to be a main factor of success. But then when you look at it, I have a lot of conversations with people that say, oh, I had a horrible discovery call. The person just interrogated me. They asked me a ton of questions, right? But where does that come from? That discovery call that, that feels that way. It's it's lack of ability to really read the room or lack of ability to really gauge your prospect on the other end and say, Ooh, maybe I'm coming on a little strong. Like let's let's slow down and let's listen. Yeah. And and so the one stat that stuck with me that I will leak out to the to the audience a little bit early is I believe it was twelve percent, and that was high EQ versus average EQ, you had a 12% higher win and close rate with reps that had a high EQ compared to those that were just in the standard group. Right. And, and that was just at the end of the day, like I couldn't get any more. I mean, to get that type of research back as, as a marketer, you're going, this is amazing. But I think it resonates with all the conversations we've had on this podcast with past guests. And, and so, so fun to be able to, to, really kind of quantify this. Yeah. What are some of the other insights that- Well, that's you know, I was going to say, and then the fun part is sort of like why, because, you know, that statistic, while yeah. surprising maybe to a lot of people on the on your podcast uh, in terms of the number, like, wow, that is, a, I think most people would have guessed it's higher, right? Like, yeah. But it's now we can quantify it a little bit. But but it what, what was fun about your, about working on your research project was why is it higher? <laughs> Yeah. You know, and one is what we just said. It, it's the ultimate accelerant on top of all other sales skills. But when we dug under the hood, we saw some other reasons why it's higher. For example, we found that customers will say that someone with high EQ is actually a different kind of seller. Um, oh, wow. I, I'm very passionate, Tim, that we in the sales world are starting to explore the wrong question, not starting. We've been, we've been exploring the wrong question for a long time, which is how do we make our salespeople better? Uh -huh. And w there's no shortage of ways to make your salespeople better. What we should be trying to say is how do we make our salespeople different? Because customers now tell us at FSU, hey, you know what? 10 years ago, 15 years ago, I'd have five bad sales conversations and one good one when we were talking to six vendors. And it made it pretty easy 
<laughs> to, to pick the one good one and move on. But yeah. now because of all the advances in sales training, sales technology, you know, enablement tools, what buyers tell us now is if I'm evaluating six vendors, I'll have five really good conversations. <laughs> Yeah. The sales game has been elevated and they say, but what I can't tell is how are those five good conversations different? Like they're, they're, they're all good, but all good in the same way. Mm -hmm. So what customers tell us is I have they, an even harder time telling sellers apart now than I did 10 and 15 years ago. Everybody walks and talks and, you know, looks the same. They know the words to say, yeah. they know the slides to use. Yeah. I mean, in a good yeah. way. I mean, it's good yeah. to say the profession has upped its game, but we've all upped our game equally. <laughs> uh huh. So at the end of the day, a customer, uh, you know, can't tell the difference. It's just as a quick aside, I used to work for a training company, did some consulting mm -hmm. work for a training company. And uh, a company in the tech space actually called us to talk about, you know, hey, can we buy your sales training? I'm not kidding. Two weeks later, their number one competitor called us and said, can we talk about engaging you guys for sales training? And it just, I had this sort of light bulb moment where I'm like, how many people are out there doing things in the sales world to a stalemate? Yeah. You know what I mean? It's like, I make an improvement in my tech stack or I make an improvement in my training. I don't actually get an advantage. All I do is go to a stalemate. Yeah. And again, I, I'm just passionate that that's happening in the industry. And at the end result for the customers, they can't tell people apart. So where am I going with this? One of the things we found in our study is that EQ actually is a differentiating factor. Customers will rate a seller with high EQ, even if they talk about the same stuff. <laughs> yeah. But that EQ, they talk about it in a way where they can sort of monitor the highs and lows. And they, they talk about the right thing at the right time because of EQ. Um, they're, they, they're seen as different. So customers, it wasn't just that, hey, this is a good salesperson with high EQ. The customer said this was a different salesperson, different kind of salesperson. So I think another sort of important takeaway for your podcast audience is, hey, it's not mm -hmm. just about being better. It's what does EQ do for us in our sales organization by being different? And that, that's important. I think it goes back to some of the foundational stuff. I mean, we, we've seen over the last 10 years, all of these emails, all of these things be optimized. We're seeing AI and generative formats, right? Optimizing the perfect email to send, the perfect LinkedIn post. And you're right. I think at a certain point, then everything just is really good vanilla. Yeah, <laughs> that's a great, great way to say it. Yeah, right? it's amazing, but it's really good vanilla. And nobody goes back and goes, oh, I remember this one place five years ago where I had the best vanilla ice cream. Yeah, it's always something unique or different that that sets you apart. Really good call out and excited to, to dive into more of this research. The other thing I'll, I'll tease out is we're even getting some of our Q for sales product into the live hands of students and sellers to test some of these things out in terms of accuracy and all of those pieces in a real live selling environment, which is a whole nother way of testing and research that FSU offers that is beyond anything I've ever seen. So not only academic, but also getting to trial and, and kind of trial by fire, learn how some of these technologies work in, in, a, in, a, in an environment of both real and tested. Yeah. Well, so. sure. That's a win-win here too, right, Tim? Because we want our students yeah. to come out exposed to sales technologies. And uh, so we are appreciative of companies like q for sales who are willing to uh, let us, uh, let the kids play with the toy, so to speak, uh, because that it, uh, it really is a good experience for them to, to come out and uh, have conversational intelligence tools that they know how to use already uh, coming out of the program, but you're right. You know, that also creates yeah. more, more lab space <laughs> and yep. more ways for us to test things. Um, and so we're very excited that, that the third thing I was going to say was this idea that, uh, you know, our, our research showed that, uh, sellers are not very good at remembering customer sentiment. Uh, this was a, a to me, the, my favorite sort of finding out of the research was if you give somebody, if you have a conversation, so you and I are having this conversation today, if I come uh -huh. back a week from now and I say, hey, what did you, uh, Tim, what did we talk about? You're going to get some of the facts, right? You'll list them down. But then if I came to you and said, hey, Tim, did Left like that part of the conversation or did Left not like that part of the conversation? Or was he neutral, right? Yeah. Well, obviously, so for every fact, you could sort of put a, you could think of it as negative, neutral, or positive. 
And what we found in the sort of a third study with with you all was this idea that uh, people tend to forget the sentiment actually faster than the facts. Wow. So we'll remember that we had a conversation about sales programs and that there are other schools that have them and so on. But when you when you say, hey, Tim, was left positive or negative or neutral on the fact that other schools are doing this, you're going to say, oh, well, left was you know three weeks from now. You might say left was pretty negative about that. All right. And it, really, I wasn't right. I was saying, no, yeah. no, it's a good thing that we're doing that. So that's interesting, because if salespeople are forgetting the sentiment faster than the facts, what's the end result? They show up to the next meeting. They talk about the wrong thing because yeah. they're like, oh, a customer remembered feature A and they loved it. Um, and so I want to talk more about that when I go back, when actually that was a pretty neutral or maybe even a negative sentiment toward that. You wanted them to be positive toward it, <laughs> which yeah. is probably why you're projecting on to the customer. They were positive on it when they really weren't. So uh, I say all that to say our, our follow up study to that in the fall is going to be we're going to do a lot of work on that using our students and using yeah. your tool to see, hey, does the Q for sales tool actually improve on that? Does it help people, you know, sort of like in a note taking kind of way? Does that sentiment yeah. feedback that they're getting throughout the call, does it stick with them so that if we go ask them two weeks from now, hey, what was the sentiment of different parts of that sales meeting? The, the tool helped ingrain it in them so that their their sentiment memory is even better. Um, so we're excited to go see what what we find when we uh, do that. But there's just an example of how partnering with you and yeah. using, using our students combined with technology gives us a pretty cool lab and, and some cool research to do. Well, and, and you're getting my mind thinking because you're, you're spot on about the idea of like we project it, right? I mean, we could be talking about pricing on a sales call and somebody says, ah, sounds great. Yep, pricing's good, but tell me more about it. So then you have a good five minute conversation. Oh, well, what were the topics you talked about last time? These things. And yeah, you don't want to bring those things up. And I, and I find that either sales has a trouble dealing with, hey, I'm putting too much time on the wrong account or I'm putting too much time on the wrong topics and I'm not moving something forward. Right. So two things that should be really, really important to kind of research out and see if we can find some more. Yeah. So if it's like the Michael Scott effect, right? Like Michael Scott, yeah. everybody in his mind, everybody always loved what he was doing. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and, but, but he was wrong about it. Right? He was wrong about the sentiment. And, uh, and it was because he had such a strong passion about things he was usually getting himself into that he was projecting that onto other people. I think that's very real. I think salespeople, Get, especially yeah. especially around new widgets, right? Like, oh, we're the only one in, in town that has this cool new widget or feature. And so you start to project that, of course, the salesperson is going to love it because we all love it in our building. And we did yeah. the, the raw, raw sales kick off about how great this is going to be. And we even saw a customer up on the screen who, who talked about how great this feature is. What we're doing to our salespeople is we're priming them to sort of misremember <laughs> or inaccurately remember the sentiment of, customers. And so yeah. um, anyway, this is going to be a lot of really cool research coming out of that idea of uh, sentiment memory. Um, yeah. Yeah. I think it's, uh, Tim, you've given me, it's going to be our Nobel Prize moment over at the FSU Sales <laughs> Institute. We're going to be the first to do uh, cutting edge research on sentiment memory. I, I love it. And I can't wait to share the report. I can't wait to, uh, again, be somebody who's, who's supporting and evangelizing sales in a whole new way, because at the end of the day, this podcast, the stuff we've been doing is all about bringing the human back into enterprise sales and having some technology to support that a little bit. So um, really, really fascinating. And, and that report for our listeners, for those that are catching this podcast, it'll be coming up a little bit later this fall. Um, but in the meantime, what are some of the things I got to shift a little bit? What are some of the things left that you see changing in the sales industry? What are some trends that you're seeing going on and what are you excited about in the future? Yeah. Well, uh, you know, a few things, obviously, uh, in the last, what, 120 days, uh, every doom and yeah. gloom AI is gonna, you know, somehow <laughs> take our jobs, put, take us like, take us off the planet, right? Like this, yeah. uh, AI is good. We're all doomed. Um, and, uh, you know, I think you get that kind of reaction with, uh, you know, any earth shattering innovation that's hit the world. We've all had really crazy reactions to it. I think we're settling down a little bit. And in fact, uh -huh. uh, we just had a conference at FSU uh, two weeks ago where the conversation was about future topics of sales education and and how is AI going to impact it? You know, I think some of the interesting things is, you know, we spend a lot of time on prospecting 
at FSU. Yeah. You know, how do you find a customer? And I think we can stop. Like, I mean, <laughs> you know, I think AI is going to be such a really great tool for helping you find and qualify and even start yeah. to get some level of sort of some needs discovery, maybe before you even talk to the customer all from AI tools. So I think, um, which I think is a good thing. I think that's a positive thing for the sales profession because yeah. when you think about where do we get a lot of our negative connotations around salespeople and what stage of the sales process do we get the most sort of frustration as a customer? It's from the yeah. prospecting phase, right? Spot on, you know, You're spot on there. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that's where we piss people off, pardon the French, but that's where we make <laughs> people mad as salespeople. And so I think that you letting the technology tools do some of that and letting a customer interact with an AI tool that would sort of qualify or disqualify and in some ways let the customer opt in yeah. to, to the sales process in a more efficient way. We end up having, I think the ultimate end result is going to be better conversations uh, because we're starting. But, you know, everyone runs around the sky, the sky's falling because customers are engaging with sellers later and later in the process. Uh -huh. I would argue, is that really a bad thing that the customer is showing up more educated, more, more knowledgeable about what's going on in the industry, more willing to talk to us because they read things about us that seem positive to them? Like, is that really we always read that stat in a negative way? And I would argue maybe it's not so bad that the customer is in a better men mental space <laughs> when yeah. they start to engage us as as sellers. Um, so I do think sort of that front end of the sales process is going to get changed dramatically. And I think probably for the better. Um, I do think what I see changing a lot is um, what, one of the highlights of my career, Tim, is I got stuck in a car in traffic in Orlando, Florida with uh, a gentleman named Neil Rackham. And okay. most people in, in the sales world will know Neil Rackham because he wrote the book called Spin Selling. Yes. You know, spin Selling has just been the foundational sort of sales methodology for going on the better part of 35 years. Uh, so anyway, in this conversation, I asked Neil, this happened just about 10 years ago, maybe a little less. I said, Neil, hey, you know, what, what do you see? What are you surprised yeah. about in the sales world and, and, and uh, how it's changing? He said, well, I, I honestly, I can't believe spin selling is still around. And I said, what? The this is, this, this is your baby. Like you wrote this book. Like, <laughs> And he said, yeah, honestly, I just thought something else would have displaced it by now. Yeah. And I think he's just one of these men that is ahead of his time, because I do think now we're starting to see spin selling or that foundational consultative style of selling being displaced. Now, why is it being displaced? Because a lot of times when the seller shows up now to interact with a customer or vice versa, the customer has mm -hmm. already done their own needs discovery process. I've yeah. already sort of scoped my problem. I already know how bad it hurts. I already know how quickly I should fix it. I already know what the benefits of fixing it are. Like, I don't need you to spin sell me. Uh -huh. <laughs> I'm literally going to give you this, what, what we've done in terms of our problem scoping. Sellers need to be able to do two things. One is, did they miss anything? Right? Yeah. So it's, it's not needs discovery anymore. It's needs confirmation. And that distinction is important. <laughs> Because if you start down the discovery path when you should be going down a distinction, you know, a, a confirmation path, you've you automatically, you know, again, you've turned a customer off. They, uh -huh. I don't need you. So, where am I going with this, Tim? Methodologies are changing quickly, and our research at FSU shows that, um, you know, hats off to the challenger guys. I think yeah. they they were one of the ones that started to help us call into question a lot of the methodologies that are in play. Where I would disagree with them is that they say something like 70% of all sellers are challenger sellers. That's not what our research shows. Our research shows top performers aren't challengers. They're not consultative sellers. They're not relational. They're not product feature sellers. They're all of those things. Yeah. What sets a high performer apart is they know when to be <laughs> a challenger versus when to be a consultative seller. So I think methodologies are expanding and changing. I think sellers have to be more adaptive than ever before, but, uh -huh. but this is where technology can come back into play. I think there's going to be a lot of tools, yours included, that can yep. give sellers clues. Hey, you might want to go down this methodology path with this mm -hmm. customer based on things they've said and how they've reacted to things you've said uh, so far. So. This, this adapt, the adaptability is going to be huge and yeah. but easier as uh, technology comes into play. 
That almost makes me excited to hear because I'll share really quickly a, a, an anecdote of a personal story. So I was shopping for a barbecue, pretty good size purchase, nothing that I'm, you know, it's not a car, but good, good dollar amount. And I did all my research and then I called the person and I pretty much had, okay, is it this model or this model? Or is it this or this? And that was exactly what he did. He got on the call at first and he was like, Hey, can I take you through all of them? And I said, Nope, I'm researched. <laughs> and he pivoted immediately and said, well, what did you like? And what do you have questions on? Yep. And then I shared that with him and maybe not to the company's love, but to my satisfaction and where I would promote and go back to this company and back to the seller is he said, no, nah, you know, based on your situation, you don't need that model. You can do this one and you'll be just as happy and spend a little bit more money here and don't spend as much money here. And it was very consultative and supportive, but he didn't try and put me through a whole process. He didn't try and ask me a thousand questions. He answered what I needed, understood that I was pretty educated on it, and then just followed up to give me all the information for all the logistics, all the speeds and feeds and all the things I'd need to do to get it implemented or get it done. And I also think that in the pre-sales is something that maybe a lot of organizations miss. A lot of the times it's like, I, I want to buy it, but now I need to see what it's like to actually plug it on, turn it in, set it up in my environment. And I need you as more of a guide to do that, especially in technology sales. Right. Which is is moving the seller back in the process. But still, it's it's where I think they can have the best impact because it's eliminating buyer remorse. Yeah. Right. You talked about, hey, the the seller that's just kind of the, the the sleazy car salesman of the of the olden days that we always get a bad rap for. But if I'm really somebody that's guiding you and helping you and giving you all the, the resources to make it successful in your environment, now I've just turned into a totally different role. Yeah. Now it's that service organization. Yeah, and for the next customer, maybe he is starting back at square one and he needs to yeah. walk through the, right? That's the thing. It's, um, I think we've gotten qualification sort of wrong over the years because I think when you think about what are we doing in qualification, we've been really trying to figure out is this a good or a bad customer? In other words, high mm -hmm. chance to buy or low chance to buy. And I would argue we're missing one more critical element to the qualification process, which is and and what type of selling process do they require? <laughs> yeah. Because you can actually like end up with two high, like they're highly qualified. They, they both have a really high chance of buying but only if we approach them in the correct way. And mm -hmm. in this case, you had someone in your grill example, smart enough yeah. to read the situation and go the right direction very quickly. I think that's something that the qualification tools in the future need to be doing. They need to do more than just say, thumbs up, thumbs down, do we pursue this? It should be thumbs up, we pursue it. And based on what we've learned through the qualification process, this is how we should chase them. Um, and uh, having you know a data-driven approach that dictates that to, to sellers. Like, hey, we've got data that says this kind of yep. customer, this is your best approach. Um, having, you know, having all that kind of cool tech, tech, tech and, and data analytics available to sellers is gonna be game changers. Um, but it also creates new problems, right? Like, cause now that what that means is we gotta teach sellers not how to sell one way, but maybe how to sell four ways. Yeah. And I've had a lot of CEOs look at me and say, wait a second, I couldn't get them to do the one way. <laughs> <laughs> and, and now you're telling me I got to do four. Like, yep. but I think that's where, again, technology can sort of do some on demand coaching to, to help. But but my answer back to them is, yes, that's what I'm telling yeah. you. You got to teach them four ways or you're going to get left behind. Well, I, I'm excited to see the future of sales. I think there's a lot of optimism in the in the different people that I've talked to, yourself included. I love seeing what Florida State's doing. A big shout out there and for all your support in, in the Sales Institute and our research. For those that want to get in touch, for uh, for those that want to go maybe meet with you in Florida or come by the university, what's the best way to get in touch with you, Lef, and uh, kind of share those details with everybody on the on the podcast? Well, I, you know, maybe my parents were, you know, <laughs> clairvoyant. <laughs> Uh, naming me Left Bonnie uh, was a pretty smart marketing strategy on their part because um, as of about two weeks ago, I've, I put my name in LinkedIn. Only one returns back. Uh, so uh, I don't have go. to really spend a lot of time telling people how to find me. Go to LinkedIn and write Left Bonnie and, and you're going to just get one. It makes it really easy. 
Awesome. And and follow his journey. See some of the stuff they're doing at the university. If you are leading a sales organization and you are looking for talent in today's market, also please connect because I can tell you just from the talent I met there, these kids are going to be absolute rock stars in their, in their field in the next few years. And uh, really excited to continue the research with you. Lef, thanks so much for coming on B2B EQ. Really cool insights that you shared today. Uh, great conversation, Tim, and um, and thank you for the support and, and letting us uh, be a part of things uh, and at the Sales Institute. We, we need companies like you showing up, asking us to do these things for us to survive. So thank you. Hey, well, that's what it's all about. We, we thrive together. And uh, to all of our listeners, thank you for tuning in to another episode of B2B EQ. Go ahead and follow, like, share, comment, give us your feedback, send it over to a friend that might need some help with sales enablement or sales coaching or sales leadership. And uh, We'll talk to you next time. Thank you. We hope you enjoyed this episode of B2B EQ. Be sure to rate, subscribe, and follow the podcast for more exciting insights. To learn more about the value of EQ and the technology powering today's conversations, visit us at unifor.com.